Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the community interviews. And we are here in Microsoft Ignite, the tour in London. And I have here April Edwards with me. So, hello, April. Hello, Mohammed. How are you? Yes, I'm fine. Good. It's really good to have you here. So, first, let me start by um, you know asking you to have an introduction about yourself, what you are doing, where are you based? Mm -hmm. So, I'm actually based in the UK and I work for our commercial uh, software engineering team. I'm a senior software engineer and also a cloud advocate for Azure as well. Yes, that's great. So uh, if you can give us an introduction about uh, the topics that you are presenting in this event. Okay. So on the tour, I get to present a multitude of different topics. So today's topic is about storing uh, your data in Azure. So it's going to cover off basics like actually how storage works, some benefits, use cases for it, but also things like databases and well and, and, and all those things that we can kind of deploy to. Um, the other talks I'm, I'm, I'm going to cover off are more DevOps focus, so things like Azure pipelines, A-B testing as well. Um, so those are sessions tomorrow. So I'm covering off a wide breadth of, of technologies. Yeah, that's a great. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and so for, for, you know, talking about pipeline, all this A-B and testing, so mm -hmm. why this is important to embrace that technology or this this practices? So most customers, when they're, whether they're on-premise or in the cloud, are looking to be more um, agile in their organizations. They might be working in a waterfall methodology or monolithic applications. And they, when they start looking at the cloud, they start thinking, how do we be more agile? How do we do it right? What's the best practice, right? Yeah. Um, and whether you're on-premise or in the cloud, we have great toolings, tools at Microsoft that help you achieve that. Um, and I think looking at pipelines and continuous integration, continuous delivery, it starts opening up what we can do with organizations and making them more agile. And, and, and I think the big thing about DevOps is it's about development teams and operation teams. Yeah. And what we want to do is start bringing them together to, to deliver value to our customers and, and to their customers. So what is that value? That, I mean, that's not just code anymore. It's, you know, we need an infrastructure to run on. Uh, we need to automate that. So I work with a lot of organizations and ops teams and talking about infrastructure as code, using things like Terraform, ARM templating, et cetera. Um, and then we talk to the dev teams about how they deploy their code and making small code changes and making them more agile. So the DevOps topic is massive, and it, and it includes every part of an organization and not just, you know, your dev team and your op team. So we're really trying to break down those barriers and make those customers really embrace the cloud and, and really love what they do and make their jobs more efficient because no one likes 3 a.m. calls, right? <laughs> yeah. so, so that's exactly why we, we start talking about those technologies. Yes, and so what we expecting, you know, like in the future in this area, how do you see that? It's, it's always evolving. DevOps is continuously evolving. So we always talk to customers and go, what's the definition of done? But the definition of done might be in a sprint cycle or a small piece of a project. It's constantly evolving. So what does this look like for the future? I mean, we're still working with customers that are still trying to figure out how to work ag in, in an agile methodology. Um, and we're a very agile organization within Microsoft as well, and we had to figure it out. Yeah. So I think it's constantly evolving. There's no really end game. And I think as more customers have hybrid environments and multiple cloud environments, it's a constantly changing game. And I think the big biggest thing we see is automation. Yeah. So I work with a lot of ops teams and they're going, right, I'm a storage expert or I, you know, I manage an infrastructure. I'm going to be out of job. The reality <laughs> is they're not. Um, you know, when you go to Azure, you're, you're consuming infrastructure as a service, you're consuming compute, and data becomes a hot topic. So not just maybe the storage and maybe the nuts and bolts and where you plug in cables, but you're more proactive. Yeah. So we see people being more proactive in their organizations, um, and then we start automating. So your infrastructure teams need to look at how they automate their builds. How do they deploy faster? Um, and the dev teams are working that same kind of methodology and they, they want the infrastructure to be deployed and and the ops teams are going oh we're out of resources on prem so what do we do so we then start looking at automation from both sides of the fence yeah oh, that's great so how do you see the cloud computing i mean in the past and present and in the future in terms of adoption and also for uh development responding i mean the market mm -hmm. So I think, so when, when Azure first came to fruition many years ago, it was called Windows Azure. Yeah. So everyone was like, right, this is a Microsoft platform, it's Windows only, not for open source, not for devs. We rebranded it to Microsoft Azure, um, and it's a very open source friendly, friendly platform. So we have things like, you know, bring your own code, um, and things like Kubernetes and open source products that deploy onto our platform. So it's evolved. The Microsoft ecosystem is massive. Um, so we've really taken a journey at Microsoft to, to be inclusive to all technologies, in our cloud. So we see customers looking going, right, I'm a Java developer. Oh, I can put my code in Azure. Awesome. And we're continuously releasing products to, to help developers, infrastructure teams alike. Um, and especially in the cloud, we had a lot of infrastructure as a service. So virtual machines, um, more scalable than what customers were doing on-prem, but they weren't really agile in, in their environments. Now we see a lot of platform as a service and, and serverless. And especially in Azure, we have a lot of 
technologies and services that you can buy pre-packaged and it's almost offered like software as a service as well with third parties and partners offering their services. So it's just evolved into this massive ecosystem where you can purchase what you need, pay as you go, it's highly scalable. It's definitely become gone from just building servers to kind of platform as a service, software as a service, highly evolving. And then you can hook in things like machine learning and AI. So we're evolving the way you're consuming your data in the cloud. It's just been a massive change and a really good, really good journey for us. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so that changes too fast. You know, we don't have time to, to learn everything. So how about adopting that? Uh, either from individuals or also from the business. Yeah, it, it, it's overwhelming. Yes. I think that's that's the reality of it. It is yes. so overwhelming when you start looking at Azure and you're going, wow, there are hundreds of services, what do I do? Um, so we have a great website called Microsoft Learn. Yeah. And it's a great starting point to learn some of the basics and continue on from there. And I always tell people, what are you passionate about? Like you have your day-to-day -day job and that stuff's really important, but what are you passionate about? You know, and you start doing Microsoft Learn, you start thinking, oh, what about this? And starts triggering things in your head going, this is cool, I want to go do this. And you start building on that. So I think pick something you, you like and start there, something that really interests you and intrigues you. And I think the biggest thing is you have to realize you're not going to know everything. <laughs> so when I'm in front of customers and they ask me a question about data, something very specific on data or machine learning, or maybe it could be Kubernetes, we have a whole team of specialists to run to. Yeah. We have teams that are completely, you know, kind of deep in topics. We have subject matter experts. Um, and then we have people that are a bit more broad brushstroke or whatever, and, you know, certain technology stacks. So it's really important, you know, at Microsoft, I don't know all the answers. Um, I'd love to know all the answers, but it's a massive platform. So we see a lot of specialists. But Microsoft Learn's great um, for customers using, um, like, you know, things like hands-on labs. We have a lot of free hands-on labs online. Um, in my organization, we have something called the Open Hack program. So these are going to be hacks all around the world, different topics. So we might do a data center migration topic, DevOps, uh, containers. So I do a lot of containers open hacks, and customers are like, we want to do Kubernetes. Um, and we do this three-day hack, so you can go and learn for free. And it's three days, you have Microsoft Teams on there, you have subject matter experts, and you can get really deep dive on that technology. So there's some great learning resources out there. That's really fantastic. So, okay, how, how do you see the change for the job trends in the market? I mean, in now and in the future, for the next few years? Yeah, and it, and it would, Everyone's scared a little bit of cloud. I was in that place, you know, many years ago, I was running a large infrastructure for an enterprise company in the US and I was scared of the cloud. I'm like, I'm gonna be out of job, what do I do? Um, and after many, many outages, I learned, wait a minute, I could, I could not have calls at three in the morning. So I think I turned, my mindset had to go from reactive to proactive. So anyone that's kind of employed today and thinking, where does my career go? We need to think, do I wanna be more proactive? Do I wanna actually do the things in my infrastructure and make my, you know, deliver that value to the organizations better. So automation's big. Um, you know, when I talk to storage teams, data is a data is a big topic. So customers are consuming data in the cloud, and it's it's about how we can. Um, really focus on what that data is doing and get more metrics out of it. So it's expanding your skill set, um, automating a lot more, and being able to deliver faster to businesses. So I think you know when you look at infrastructure teams and devs, we want to deliver more faster. And it's there's so many tools out there and so many learning paths. And I think that's a great place to start. Um, and I think you're going to see a lot of automation engineers in the next few years. Um, and AI and machine learning is massive. So everything we kind of deploy, customers are looking to hook in AI and machine learning to get more data back. How do we actually understand what our systems are doing? So with more data, we can kind of make more changes and adapt our businesses. So we see a lot more agile organizations just delivering faster with more data, and it's really cool. So they're able to just deliver better to their customers with that feedback. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so some people reaching out asking me, okay, I, I'm a developer or I'm a tester. Is this enough or should I learn anything else? Or, you know, this kind of um, uncertainty about uh, so, what do you think about them? <laughs> <laughs> um, I had this. I had a conversation with someone recently about this. Um, they might have been very open source minded. I love PowerShell, and we had a debate about PowerShell, and they're like, "Well, it's for Windows people," and I'm like, "Well, with the new release, it's more for open source." We're seeing the biggest uptake from of PowerShell in the open source community because we've started enabling some features in it now. It would have been great to have five years ago, but it is what it is today. Um, so. I see kind of like these QA and, and dev roles being more cross-platform. So I think it's okay now to say, you know, I'm just not maybe one technology, maybe I can spread myself across others. So maybe if you're, you know, developing PHP or .NET, what have you, um, you know, you're looking at Rust or Go. Um, so we see a lot, of, a lot of devs and a lot of QA teams looking at different you know, potential learning paths, but also maybe different roles within their organization. And when you start talking DevOps, those roles start to gray out grows, roles change, um, and it's always adapting and evolving your role and learning these new technologies and not being afraid to, and that's the big step. Yeah, that's great. What is your advice for students and fresh graduates, people reaching out 
asking me how can I join uh, big companies? You know, what is the roadmap for doing that? So Microsoft, we actually have an intern program. Um, I, and I don't know all the countries that are available in. I know in the US and the UK, specifically here in the UK, we have a massive intern program. Um, they can apply and um, we do it like as a gap year in their school. I think it's between years two and three here in the UK. Um, and I actually mentored a few of the interns. So they can take a year off from school, have a paid internship and get that experience. And I think, you know, as your graduate level student, um, I have a bit of an interesting view. You know, I went to university, I got a degree. Um, my degree means nothing to what I do today. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I always tell people, if you're a student, <laughs> stick with what you love. And, 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 you know, and I think, you know, I, I talk to a lot of students that are like, you know, they came near their intern year and actually they want to shift what they're doing. So I mentored an intern that was focused on kind of infrastructure and application development. He went into AI and he loves AI and quantum physics and great. And that's where he's taken it. So it was a great learning experience. So I'd say, you know, apply for internships, um, reach out to local teams, go to events. I mean, Microsoft holds so many of these local events like Ignite the Tour. If they can take a day off or half a day off and, and go out to these events and start networking, networking is the big thing as well. And then start getting interested in things like blogging, start looking at videos like your video, you know, <laughs> and then reach out, you know, you want these students to reach out to you. And I think every person that works in the tech industry has had a very different journey. Yeah. Um, my journey has been interesting. It's not been a straight line. It's done this, you know, <laughs> and most people I know have been in and out of tech or have done different things or, you know, it, it's not a straight line path. And I think that's what, what people need to be understanding of. Like it, it's going to change. And um, I get a lot of questions about women in tech as well. Yeah. And that's a tough topic because, you know, a lot of people have families and responsibilities after a certain age. And, um, you know, I, I think the industry leans itself to be able to work from home a lot yeah. and have that flexibility. So I think it's a great industry to get involved in. Um, and you know, I always promote people to go into tech when and where possible. <laughs> yeah. What is your golden tip for pass an interview? Be yourself. Yeah. And be honest. Um, you know, I when I had my interview with Microsoft, um, I was nervous. I was really nervous, and I'm like, gosh, Microsoft is full of smart people. <laughs> but it is, yeah. but they're people. We're yeah. just people. You know, we all live, breathe the same air. We're and we're just human beings at the end of the day. So when I went into my interview, um, and I'm a very visual person, so I said, can we can we draw this out? And he goes, yeah, absolutely. So the guy that did my interview, we're, we're drawing everything out, and I'm like, ah, and it triggered things in my head. So I had to work to my strengths, and we were going through something, and I'm like. <sighs> I'm just not sure about this piece, you know, in drawing it out and, and in architecting this. And he goes, oh, let me help you. So I told him I didn't exactly know per se where we're trying to go with this piece. And he helped me through it and we talked it through. And he could see my line of thinking and my process in my head. And that was great because he could kind of get my personality out of that. And I was being genuine. I was being myself. And I was being open. I was being honest. I was being truthful. Um, and I think that's the, you have to be yourself. And, and especially at Microsoft, be you. Um, it's all about being who you are. And that's unique to any organization, whether you work for a partner or another company, be you. Because you can deliver a lot more to that organization than being someone you're not or trying to, you know, to kind of, um, you know, go into an industry where maybe you don't think you'll fit in. I mean, be you and I think just be genuine and be honest and be truthful. That's great. Thank you. Well, finally, uh, from your experience, how to be uh, a high performing, uh, you know, uh, professional mm -hmm. in, in a company? Not everyone wants to be high performing. I think that's the <laughs> tough one. Some people have different goals in mind and, and they're, they're different stages in their life. And for me, it's cyclical. So I may have some goals I want to achieve and a lot of projects I want to do and I'm, I have to kind of organize. So if you want to be high performing, you know, there's, there's lots of great reading you can do and um, learnings and that's a soft skill. That's massively a soft skill. So you could be really good technically, but to be high performing, like where do you want to go? How do you want to get there? For me, it's organization. Like I know what my goals are going to be. Are they realistic? Um, and I schedule them in. And so personally for me, I have to kind of live and breathe by my diary and just know, right, this day I'm doing this and this day I'm doing this, but I'm also constantly learning. So the biggest thing for me to be high performing is I carve out learning days for myself. It might be half a day, it might be a full day, um, and then I can constantly learn that technology and then kind of think of the next steps. Because I might go on a project and think, I'm really interested in this technology, and then I start on it and go, actually I have this other thought or maybe a different way to apply it. So I'm constantly willing to adapt and change and I'm constantly learning. But um, you know, you have to be driven a little bit to be high performing sometimes and yeah. sometimes it's okay to take a step back. Um, I think you know, people will see this video and go, wow, she's really energetic. <laughs> but what they might not see is you know, maybe next week I'm offline, you know, I'm heads down um, and I'm just quiet. So I think it's okay to have that cyclical behavior and maybe have that off time. Um, and I think the key to being high performing for me is having something to disconnect with outside of work and having that off time. So for me, it could be, you know, my own hobbies and activities. Um, and then I get recharged and I come back in, I do the learnings and I'm like, right, let's go, 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 go. <laughs> so I think for me, that's, that's how I address it. But I think everyone's absolutely different. But that yeah. disconnect really helps me get excited coming back into it. 
that was really awesome. Uh, really, thank you so much for, for your, your time. And I'm uh, really looking forward to seeing you in other events soon. <laughs> great. Thank you for having me. Thanks. It was great thank to be you. here.